You on Netflix is a very disturbing series that for many of us highlighted the realities of obsession with the main character of Joe Goldberg who becomes obsessed with actually multiple women but yet we're seeing it from his perspective. So my video today is about what we learned from this show and how we kind of rooted for Joe despite knowing that he's a bad guy and some people even were making comments on social media like I would love if Joe stalked me or trying to justify his decisions or even blaming the women in his life. So the fact that this show is framed from the killer slash stalker's thoughts, the fact that we see it through his eyes makes us understand his motivations a lot more than if we were viewing it from the outsider point of view. So today I'm going to go through the evolution of the show from seasons one to four and this is actually a re-upload. It's just that I wanted to compile everything into one big banging video for you guys. So each season I discuss will be a new day, new outfit. Hey there you, see what I did there? Sneaky. So, in case you guys couldn't tell by the title, today we're doing a deep dive. I really enjoyed this show. If you haven't seen you, it's like the next Gone Girl or American Psycho or Dexter because it follows a lot of morally questionable characters, especially Joe. And I'm not sure there are any other videos out there that talk about the show the way I'm going to today because I'm going to break down the psychology of someone like Joe Goldberg and more importantly, I really want to dive into why so many people like this guy or at least sympathized with him somewhat. Because Joe, even though he's a villain, his main motivation is I do this for love, that tends to delude a lot of the viewers, especially because we spend so much time in Joe's head. We're trained to root for the couple to hope that things will work out for them in the end, even though we know the whole relationship is built in a fantasy. I read the book that you was based on years ago and I remember, although I loved the key concepts of it, I found the writing style quite unreadable, so I had to stop, but I did think it had a lot of potential as a story, so I was really pleased when I heard it would be made into a show because I thought that a lot of the themes would actually translate better on screen, and I think they did a really good job, at least in season one, of adapting it. Sure, there's some cringy dialogue sometimes and some slightly unrealistic scenes, but overall, season one was really good. So I want to start off with the crime of Joe Goldberg and the general story. I believe in love at first sight. You showcases that stereotypical rom-com formula. It breaks it down to show how dangerous a lot of rom-coms can be and even fairy tales that we were raised on. Boy meets girl, boy becomes obsessed with girl, boy makes a mistake and has to win girl back. I can think of like 50 rom-coms I've watched that follow that routine. Joe is a seemingly sweet, old-fashioned romantic, but he's actually a creep. And Beck, who seems like she's not like the other girls, is actually pretty basic. She's just a normal woman. But Joe is unhealthily obsessed with Beck. Not just like he's falling in love with her so he thinks about her a lot, but she's all he thinks about. And whenever he does a bad thing, he justifies it by saying that he's done it for her. He's done it because he loves her. Because of that, many viewers, especially the teen girls, started falling for him in the same way a lot of people had a big crush on Zac Efron when he played Ted Bundy, an extremely wicked, shockingly evil and vile. Or even with the real Ted Bundy, who was a serial killer, loads of girls had heard about the crimes he committed. They knew what kind of a person he was. It wasn't unclear or hidden from them. They saw him on the news and yet they were defending him or saying he just seems so handsome and such a nice guy he just couldn't possibly do these things. I mean there are lots of reasons as to why and I'm going to have a whole section on that in a minute. But in terms of the story Joe meets Beck in his bookstore and they have this flirty slightly unrealistic conversation because they're acting like they've known each other for years but so be it. And rather than him doing what you would expect which is if she likes me I'm sure she'll come back into the bookstore so I'll just wait for her to come back and see me again, Joe thinks that he needs to actively seek her out and stalk her and learn about her life rather than getting to know her organically. I need to know who you really are. I've 
read people wrong in the past. So he looks her up, he finds her on social media, he finds where her house is. At one point he even sneaks into her house and has a look around and then has to hide when she comes in. But he tells himself it's fine because loads of guys in romance movies get into scrapes just like this and it's all part of the love story. So it's okay. A lot of people were saying, why is Beck so obsessed worthy? Why would Joe choose her of all people? What's so special about her? He doesn't even know anything about her. But I think there are multiple reasons as to why Joe chose Beck. And she has a history of men in her life hurting her, including her dad, her boyfriends, her uncle. She's a normal woman with trauma and insecurities, and Joe chooses her. Joe hypes her up in his head so much, even though she doesn't seem, it's not that she doesn't seem worth it, but he is romanticizing her so much before he even knows anything about her. We occasionally see things from Beck's point of view, like in one episode we get quite a few insights into her mind and in the finale, but aside from that most of the show is actually from Joe's point of view, so he'll make these assumptions about Beck and we don't get to find out if they're true or not because we don't get to see inside her head the way we get to see inside Joe's. Joe chose her because whether he knows it or not he is looking for a victim, someone he can manipulate, someone who won't find out what kind of a guy he is. Someone like Peach, for example, I thought Joe would end up liking or stalking, and Peach is Beck's friend. Can we get real for a second? You have questionable taste in friends. She's lucky she has me. Beck rarely knows what's best for her. Because Peach is glamorous and rich and she knows she's beautiful and she speaks her mind, but then I realized why on earth would Joe go after someone like Peach? She is not easy to manipulate and she's not a pushover. It's the same reason things didn't work out with Karen, another woman Joe dates for a bit, because Karen knows how to hold her own and she doesn't stand for bullshit and she picks up on the red flags pretty quickly. She's seriously unnerved by that dungeon room Joe has underneath his bookshop and she tells him that much. She's like, like, ugh, what kind of a man is he? Creepy. But when Beck enters the bookstore in the first episode, in the first scene, Joe is drawn to her because immediately she seems like a bit of a pushover. And that's true for the rest of their relationship because Beck constantly puts herself down and doubts herself. And as a result, a lot of their conversations, especially in the first few episodes when Beck is less evolved, a lot of the conversations involve Beck doubting herself all the time. And she opens up to Joe about how she doesn't think she's a good writer, she doesn't think she's talented enough, she thinks she's unremarkable, and then he reassures her. And as a result, there's there's already this very weird power imbalance where Beck is sharing so much about herself but she doesn't find out a lot about Joe. And it's funny because as a result, Beck is quite self-absorbed because she's dominating a lot of the conversation and oversharing without realizing she's doing it. But you know, that's quite true to life, I think, where if we are very insecure and we doubt ourselves a lot or we have a lot of anxiety, often we do start to think that everything is about us and everyone is judging us all the time. And so we start to become a bit self-absorbed and it is possible to be self-absorbed and really insecure at the same time because you overanalyze every little thing you do and Beck totally does this but it makes it very easy for Joe because then as a result he can learn so much about her and it's very easy to figure out what her weaknesses are. But at one point Beck does pick up on this and she even says to Joe, I feel like I don't know anything about you. I don't know what your apartment looks like. I've never met any of your friends and you just don't share as much as I do. At one point Joe starts to go down on her in a department store and Beck freaks out and she's like, oh my gosh, you're not meant to do that. But then later she ends up apologizing to him and saying, I'm sorry, I was a bit skittish, I was in a bad mood, when he was the one who did the wrong thing. You're not meant to do that in a public space and he knows it. And what's funny is, Beck is apologizing for something that actually only he needs to apologize for. But this is exactly the sort of girl that Joe wants. And I didn't notice that until I watched the show for a second time because I picked up on things I hadn't noticed before. The amount of times that Beck does something wrong and then ends up doing this whole apology and sharing again and then Joe ends up accepting the apology even though Beck didn't necessarily need to apologize or maybe she did but it's funny how there's this cycle going on. Beck apologizes to Joe for sending mixed signals and she brings him a donut and they have their first kiss. She apologizes for lying to him saying her dad was dead because of her trauma. Then she apologizes for being rude and snappy when he was trying to give her advice about her dad. Then she has to apologize for being rude and not believing him when he 
tried to tell her the truth about Peach. It's so ironic because of course in a lot of those situations Beck did have something to apologize for but Joe has way more to apologize for but she doesn't know it because a lot of the bad stuff he's done he's done behind the scenes like stalking her and stealing her underwear and keeping it in a little box and being a complete perv. This show has very important themes of delusion and denial, seeing what we want to see rather than what's accurate. Beck does that with Joe at multiple points because I'm sure deep down she knows something's wrong and Joe does that about Beck, making her out to be some sort of superwoman in his head when actually she has flaws. If I just keep being the perfect boyfriend you'll realize i'm not a maybe i'm the one and he even does that with himself because he sees himself as this hero this white knight and actually he's not any of those things joe is not half as awesome as he makes out in his head he's actually a really disturbed individual but he doesn't want to see that the show also explores the dangers of stalking and social media and digital privacy it is weirdly easy for joe to track down who beck is and find her social media and then learn loads of things about her like who her friends are and where she went to school before they've even had a proper conversation and because joe doesn't have any social media that's another imbalance because beck can't find out similar things about him beck has this overly curated version of herself on social media too saying she's such a successful writer and telling people People to go and chase after their dreams and her life's so great when in reality at the beginning of the show she's actually struggling financially and she isn't feeling positive about her writing. We all know social media is fake by now but Jo is continuously let down when she disappoints him and doesn't live up to his assumptions of her. Jo is stalking Beck for a while. He never says okay I'll stalk her for X long and then I'll find a way to meet her then I'll find a way to talk to her and get to know her. He doesn't actually reveal when this plan is so I always wondered how long he would just silently stalk her for without telling her would it be months or years when he ends up actually talking to her properly for a second time after the bookshop it's not because he decided to finally make a move and have a normal connection with her it's because he had no choice she was drunk and she'd fallen onto the train tracks and he needed to save her life or she would have died and he was reluctant too the minute she felt he wasn't like oh I've got to go help her he was like oh is there anyone else here oh man do I have to save her come on get up oh she's not getting up oh man I guess I have to go save her he didn't want to which made me think how long would this stalking have gone on for but eventually he goes over to help her and he actually saves her life because he helps pull her off the tracks and she is so grateful to him she's like oh my god thank you for saving me and it's so ironic because the show opens with Joe saving Beck's life and it ends with him ending it. But they go back in this cab together and they actually have a nice, normal, quite cute conversation. But what's so funny is I was like, Joe, baby boy, you are clearly capable of being normal, of being actually suave sometimes, of being good with your words. There is no need for you to stalk these women or violate them. You could just start a relationship in the normal way and everything would be fine you don't need to sabotage everything but joe doesn't get that and he feels the need to control and micromanage everything so beck actually dropped her phone on the track somewhere and she assumed maybe she'd lost it but what she didn't know is that joe had actually stolen her phone and even when beck gets a new phone she's still logged into the cloud so joe can still track who she's messaging and keep tabs on her which is again such a massive power imbalance because she does not have access to the same information about him as their relationship evolves beck is a bit distant and even mean at points points like she's hooking up with other guys when she's starting to form this genuine connection with Joe but she's not seeming half as into him as he is into her. They have some really sweet moments as a couple and cute conversations which I think is part of the reason why some viewers began to warm to Joe but the only reason their conversations are remotely cute is because Beck doesn't know who he really is. However, there are constant obstacles or hiccups in the road and rather than Joe letting things unfold naturally, he thinks he needs to control everything and overcome these obstacles like you would in a traditional romance movie. He feels the need to fix things. It is possible that in season two, Joe will learn to overcome obstacles in a more calculated and premeditated way and I hope that happens because in season one, a lot of it follows Joe making very impulsive, rash decisions that make stuff work. 
us. For instance, hitting Peach over the head in the park without any thought of what if I'm seen. He lets Beck into his room to kiss him, even though he has her stuff that he's stolen from her lying around the room like her old phone. And he impulsively follows Beck to the house where she's holidaying for a bit with Peach to listen in on their conversations, even though it's so dumb. And he does stuff like that all the time where he acts on emotion, on impulse. But in terms of the obstacles he fights in season one, there are lots of them. One of the obstacles we didn't even know about until the end of the season is that he actually killed a man called Elijah because Joe used to have this ex-girlfriend called Candace who cheated on him. And so Joe killed Elijah even when Elijah had done nothing wrong because Elijah thought Candace was single. He never would have hooked up with her if he knew she was in a relationship. But Joe's so angry he pushes Elijah off a roof even though Elijah literally didn't deserve that and it was not justified. And we know that Joe also did something bad to Candace. But even in season one, we're still not really sure exactly what went down between the two of them, but it was bad. But when he meets Beck, he doesn't stop that vicious streak. The first obstacle is Benji, who's this guy that Beck was hooking up with for a while and Joe felt like Benji was a threat. So he kidnapped him and he did it on impulse. He had no idea what he wanted to do with Benji, but then he ends up killing Benji. He has some regrets over it, but not half as many as he should. And the next obstacle is Peach Salinger, who's this long-term friend of Beck's, but she's very controlling and weird and is actually a stalker herself. And of course, Joe picks up in this and he sees her as an obstacle because she keeps trying to separate Beck and Joe from each other and she's getting in the way of their relationship. She's also constantly holding Beck back from opportunities and when Joe realizes this, he ends up killing Peach too, although it was kind of partly in self-defense because she attacked him first. The next obstacle is Dr. Nikki, who was actually giving Beck therapy after Peach died and Beck was in a very emotional low place and so Joe starts to suspect that Dr. Nikki and Beck are having some kind of affair. Joe goes to therapy in the first place, not because he wants to better himself, but because he wants to monitor what Dr. Nikki is doing. He seriously considers killing Dr. Nikki because he follows him with this knife. I don't know what it was, but this sharp object in his hands and then changes his mind at the last minute. But he does end up um, attacking Dr. Nikki later with a gun. And then he ends up stopping himself because he thought of what Beck said about him not being a killer. And he doesn't want to be that guy who's a killer. Funnily enough, Joe's ticket to freedom was to kill Beck and frame Dr. Nikki for it, which is so ironic because it shows Joe's complete lack of respect for therapy because he literally frames a therapist for something that he didn't do. There's another person Joe kills in season one. Man, this man's a serial killer. Basically, he lives next to this woman and her young son, Parco, and they're being really abused by the woman's boyfriend, Ron and so eventually Joe intervenes and he kills Ron and that was the one murder where I felt like it was the most justified because I was seriously concerned that Ron was going to kill Paco and kill Claudia. The final person Joe kills unfortunately is Beck, which makes me so sad and it still makes me so furious to this day because she did not deserve it. Joe and Beck were going strong but they ended up separating and he got with a girl called Karen but then he cheated on Karen to get with Beck. Beck finally properly opens her heart to love for the first time in the whole series and she tells Joe that she actually truly does love him, she's sorry for pushing him away and they're stronger than ever. But then she discovers his box of evidence in the ceiling which contains Candace's necklace, Peach's phone, Benji's phone and teeth, her old phone, old underwear of hers and a diary all about her. Basically all this evidence that Joe has killed people and lied to her and stalked her. And so she freaks out and Joe knows that she found out. So he locks her in a glass cage and tries to convince her to love him again for things to be okay. He wants to give her a chance to understand him but Beck is obviously incredibly traumatized and freaked out and she doesn't love him anymore. Joe eventually kills her when Beck doesn't love him the way he needs her to and also he's doing it to save his own ass because he's worried about her telling the police or telling someone. He then pins the murder and other murders on her therapist and publishes all of Beck's old writing which in turn made her famous but she never got to see it. Joe sounds like an absolute nightmare right especially if you haven't seen the show you must be like like, what in the hell? This man is deranged. Why would anyone even remotely support him or feel any sympathy for him? But you would be surprised. So the next segment is why we swoon over Joe or why some people at least swooned over Joe. No real words. Only fake ones. 
everything ship. Oh, I love that. It's so easy, so right. This is how our story goes. I think I've cracked the code. First of all, Joe does what he thinks is the perfect boyfriend checklist. He does what he should do theoretically when he's with Beck. Like he throws her a big party because he thinks that's what she'll want for her birthday. He tries to win her over by bringing pancake mix to her house and doing cute little gestures. He follows the traditional relationship formula, yet what he does behind the scenes is really creepy. You is also a great depiction of everything that is wrong with society and the kinds of people that we sympathize with because Joe is a straight white nice looking man played by a likable actor. Joe is the epitome of toxic masculinity, the fake nice guy. Again and again, we're hoping that somehow miraculously he'll just go to therapy or Beck's love will heal him and everything will be okay. Also, whenever Joe does something morally bad, he constantly justifies it. He can't take responsibility for anything. And we're in his head all the time, hearing his internal monologue, hearing the way he thinks, being saturated with what it's like to be Joe, what it's like to think like Joe. Some people start to buy into these justifications and going, you know what, that sounds legit. And we lose touch with reality or logic. Through constant repetition of being immersed in Joe's world and hearing his justifications, hearing that he does this for love, hearing that all he wants is to be loved, it starts to sink in. An article I read on her campus, which I'll link down below, said, in literary theory, when a book is solipsistic, <laughs> It is one in which we are essentially trapped in the main character's head who seems to ramble on and draw us deeper into their world. Their thoughts mesh with our own as we read because we cannot escape their train of thought. In order to sympathize with the main character, they have to have qualities we can relate to. And in some ways we can relate to Joe. And every time he messes up and does something wrong, he rationalizes it by saying, I've done this so I can get together with Beck. I'm doing it because I just want me and Beck to be a couple. That's all I want. I'll be happy when that happens. It reminds me of a lot of serial killers. If you've ever watched any interviews with serial killers, you notice how most of them cannot take responsibility for their crimes and they'll blame it on their childhood. They'll blame it on that one time they were bullied in sixth grade. They'll blame it on this demon that possessed them and took over their body rather than just admitting the kind of person they are. We tend to like to put people into boxes like good or bad. Joe is evil, but he also has some good qualities that redeem him. He's not completely soulless. The first thing that comes to mind is his care for Paco, the kid next door. Most people, if they knew there was some kind of abusive, unhealthy dynamic going on next door, they would ignore it, turn a blind eye, bystander syndrome, they wouldn't say anything, but Joe doesn't. He tries to get involved and be a friend to Paco, to protect him. He genuinely cares about what happens to Paco in this world because Joe has this soft spot for kids. Even though he's a bad guy, kids are where he's nice. Like we see him reading to kids in the library. We see him genuinely doing the best he can in his own way to take care of Paco and be like a father figure to him. And Paco even looks similar to Joe, which highlights that he's like Joe's younger self. And although Joe does bad things that corrupt Paco. He doesn't mean to. He genuinely is doing the best he can. Also, some of the observations that Joe makes about Peach or about Beck's friends or about Peach holding Beck back or that creepy professor guy who was making Beck uncomfortable. They were all valid and sometimes accurate observations. So it's not like he's completely delusional. And then we agree with him. We have common ground. We're like, yeah, I, I mean, he's right. He's not wrong. We know about his trauma with his awful parents abandoning him and being mean to him. His jumping around between these different homes, not being able to find a family and then being raised by this really creepy bookshop manager guy who hurt him and abused him and told him that control is love. So that's shaped the way he is and the way he views the world. And when Joe came into Beck's life, there were a lot of really positive things he brought into her life before she found out the kind of guy he was. Like she learns to stand up for herself when people like Peach are controlling her. Another huge factor is that Penn Badgley plays him, this attractive, charismatic, nice guy. And that influences Joe because Penn brings a lot of charm and wit to the character. He's very funny, he's very interesting. If Joe was ugly, 
no one would be rooting for him. When we like what we see on screen, we think the person's attractive, we're so easily swayed. Imagine if he was conventionally unattractive, he was really badly maintained and maybe looked a bit dirty or had really dirty fingernails or something. I don't know, whatever you think of as unattractive, think of that. I don't think people would be half as forgiving. For a lot of viewers, they didn't want Beck to find out who Joe truly was, to open Pandora's box, to see the horrors within it, because we're kind of like, oh, but things seem to be going well, so maybe she can just stay in this bubble of delusion and everything will be okay. Especially because sometimes Joe was treated badly, genuinely, like Candace could be so mean to him. We know that Beck had cheated on him when things were going badly, and we as humans are empathetic creatures. We don't like to see people going through pain. We don't like injustice. We don't like seeing people getting hurt. And so when that sympathy card happens with Joe, we're like, oh, I feel kind of bad for him. And it's a pretty easy way to make you like a character if you just put them through a bunch of pain and heartbreak. So I believe those overall are the reasons why we start to be affected by Joe and maybe give him the benefit of the doubt sometimes, even though logically we shouldn't. I'm going to talk about why Joe is monstrous and has this really evil part of him. There is a turning point where we start to root for Beck because earlier on in the show, a lot of us were not rooting for Beck because she kind of annoyed us. And we weren't rooting for Joe either necessarily, but we weren't really rooting for either of them. At least that was my case. But there was this turning point for me in the episode Candace, the one before the finale, where Beck becomes way more likable. And that was when the roles were reversed and I started to root for her. Beck starts, first of all, actually treating Joe well and being really appreciative of him and opening her heart to love, being vulnerable. And so that's why she's investigating Candace, Joe's ex-girlfriend, because she wants to understand what's going on because she feels like Joe's hiding something from her and she just wants to have her mind put to rest. So she's actually doing some investigative digging. And I thought that was so cool, especially because in the previous episode, Karen had given Beck a warning. You need to leave Joe or he'll do what he did to Candace to you or worse. He's a creep. I don't trust him. And I'm glad that has left me because that made me see who he really is. And that planted a seed in Beck's mind. She got really unsettled and she was like, who the hell am I dating? I need to know because I'm falling for this guy. We know that beforehand Beck was quite unlikable because she pulled away from Joe and cheated on him after Peach died because she was in such a dark mental state and she just wasn't ready to love Joe and she didn't like the feeling of needing him so much. In the episode Candace, Beck could have been so open to being with Joe and really acknowledge that she likes him. And we see her texting her friends going, I'm behaving like a crazy person. Joe is amazing. But Joe becomes increasingly monster-like, I guess, as the series goes on. The living with the enemy episode is very interesting because he starts hallucinating Peach and Beck kissing and he starts imagining Beck in her underwear and he'd never hallucinated before. So it's very weird. And he keeps hallucinating as the season goes on, especially after he was in that car accident and hit his head. He suddenly hallucinates Candace sitting there in the car with him saying, hey bunny and we're like what is going on and that scar on his head after that car crash lasted for literal episodes which shows that it was a pretty serious head injury joe is a monster just maybe not what society thinks of when we think of someone unhinged or someone unsafe like there's that couple who lives next door to joe ron who's abusing his girlfriend claudia and that's what we think of when we think of the stereotypically unsafe abusive dynamic hearing yelling. Dysfunction is something very loud and in your face, but Joe's dysfunction is less obvious. Joe does very similar things that Ron does to Claudia. I know that Joe doesn't beat Beck to a pulp, but he does knock her out and kill her. Yeah, I think he strangles her to death. He does stalk her. He violates her constantly, even when they're separated and they're not together and he's with Karen. So Beck is literally not his problem. He's still checking Beck's social media twice a day. He is the epitome of an obsessed stalker. And for a lot of people, they just don't see any problem with Joe at all. They think he's fine. They think he's cute. They want to be locked in his cage of horrors, especially if you're a man justifying Joe's actions. The worst that might've ever happened to you is being cheated on or betrayed by a woman. And so you sympathize with Joe in that aspect, but maybe you have had a pretty lucky or privileged life and you've never been in danger. You've never feared a woman 
killing you or a woman hurting you in some ways. And that's not me saying women can't be abusive because they absolutely can be. But what I'm saying is, if you're siding with Joe, it may be because you don't understand the very real fear that a lot of women feel about dating someone who could potentially overpower or hurt them in some way. In fact, Gamble, the co-creator of the show, said that you is a cautionary tale for men to say, hey men, don't stalk women. This isn't a show that's meant to warn women like Beck. Protect yourself. It's not about victim blaming. It's a warning that men like this exist and it's telling men don't be like Joe. Joe has two halves because we see the book Jekyll and Hyde on his bookshelf and we also know from what the therapist said that Joe has two halves. Remember how Beck said he was Prince Charming and Bluebeard? That's Joe. He has one half of him that's a hopeless romantic and another half of him that's angry and doesn't believe in love and wants to hurt people and he's both those things. If anyone ever justifies Joe, their go-to excuse tends to be, but Joe did it for love or, but Joe did it because that's how he thinks he's going to get together with Beck because that's what Joe keeps telling us and repeating. But I realized on my rewatch that the stuff Joe does isn't for love, that's his excuse. His actions, his abuse, his predatory behavior does not stem from love. That's his excuse. It actually stems from a need to control because of the trauma in his childhood. He doesn't do bad things for a good reason. He does bad things because he wants to do bad things. You see, Joe was an unreliable narrator and he claims he does stuff for love, but no, he doesn't. If all Joe really wanted was to be loved and love someone in return, then he would have stayed with Karen, who was an absolute angel, who always complimented him, who always showered him with praise. Even before they were dating, she was like, wow, you're such a good boyfriend to throw a party for Beck. She admired him. If he really wanted love, he just would have stayed with her and been like, great, I finally found it. I found a woman who cares about me. Guess what happened? <laughs> he got bored and in a very heartless, cold, unfeeling, unsensitive way, he broke up with Karen. It wasn't kind, it was actually really rude and came out of the blue from her perspective. And he cheated on her and he disrespected her, which shows, no, he doesn't want love. He wants control. He wants someone to micromanage. He wants someone to obsess over. He wants someone to fix. Karen was whole and complete and genuine and kind. She didn't need fixing. It also gave Karen an excuse to see who he was and leave that situation and thank God she did because Karen honestly was treated really badly in that whole show and she deserved so much better and I'm glad that she was strong enough to see Joe for who he is. Although I will say this is a bit of a plot hole. We know that Beck was killed and I just find it hard to believe that Karen wouldn't hear about it in the news and go and tell the police that Joe was a freaking weirdo and had that creepy basement room because I know that Karen thought he was kind of dangerous because she warned Beck about him so surely maybe that will be addressed in season two I hope so but anyway in the finale when Beck's locked in the cage she yells at Joe for trying to control her and says I didn't need you to swoop in for me because he kept saying, I wanna fix you, you're my damsel in distress and I fixed your life and you didn't even know you were a mess before me. And Beck was like, I don't care how much of a mess I was. It was my life to fix, not yours. I'm a human being with autonomy and decisions and feelings and it's not up to you to try and fix me. Beck radiates power in that scene because for the first time she speaks her mind. The whole show I felt like she wasn't really owning her power but finally in that scene she expresses how she feels. She's real and she says, actually no, it was my mess to fix not yours, go fix your own mess. You know when someone is really controlling and they're constantly talking about other people, being other-centered, controlling other people, telling other people what to do, they're doing it as an act of avoidance to ignore their own issues. Because if they stopped focusing on other people, they would need to sit with themselves for a minute and realize the work they need to do, the self-development they need to do. So they're avoiding it by going, I don't have problems, you have problems, which is what Joe is doing. He knows he's messed up. He knows he's got evil fantasies. He knows something's wrong with him. Instead of dealing with those issues so he could become a man that is worth loving, he focuses on fixing all these women out there. 
Here's the common denominator here. Here's the reason his relationships keep failing, but he blames it on the women. Like after he kills back, he goes, yeah, we weren't compatible. You weren't right for me. I don't think you're the one because you see me for who I am. You see my flaws. You're judging me and that makes me so uncomfortable. So I'm going to say it's your problem and you're the one with the issues. I know it's awful she dies, but she dies honest, owning her power, telling him the truth, being real. Him saying that he killed Benji because he loved her or killed Peach because he loved her or attacked Peach in the park because he loved her. It's an excuse to violate and hurt women and control them. And I thought that was brilliantly put. And she even says, I think you get a kick out of it. I think you get a sense of power out of it. Beck was really grief stricken after Peach died and so she wanted to go to therapy and there were a few points where she was being a bit rude and a bit secretive and she said to Joe, you know what, I don't want to talk to you about Peach or talk to you about how I'm feeling. I think I need to get it off my chest in therapy. I need to talk to Dr. Nikki about it. And rather than Joe giving her that space and being like, okay, babe, he was like, oh, what, what? Because he could not deal with the thought of her not telling him everything, of him not being the sole person that she confided in, because again, he wants control. He wants to know what's going on in her head all the time. Joe even has a vision, a hallucination of Candace asking him, when are you going to leave Beck alone? Because otherwise you'll end up hurting her. Because he keeps saying, I do this for love, we start to believe that love is his primary motivator because he tells us it is, but you can't take anything Joe says at face value. I think he wants to believe he's doing this for love, but he's not, because if you love someone, you don't do what he does. He says that he loves Beck, yet he strangles her to death in the finale. He says he loves her, yet he doesn't give her the space that she needs. He fell out of love with her in seconds once she said that he was evil and he was a bad guy and she didn't love him. He went from I love you to, ah, oh, all right, I'll just kill you then. That's not how it works. When you love someone, you can have a big fight. You don't just suddenly fall out of love with them afterwards. If you love someone, you want to see them happy and you respect their choices. You don't go, I'll kill you because you don't love me back. Joe's behavior, his entitlement, feeling like he's owed Beck's attention is something so deeply ingrained in straight harassment and rape culture. You know when you're out at a nightclub and a girl gets her drink spiked or someone like injects her with a needle or something from these guys. They're so annoyed at the thought of the girl not wanting to hook up with them that they feel like they need to do that because otherwise they won't be able to have power over her and control her because there's this real issue with consent and her no is not enough. The same way when a girl's wearing a short skirt and gets harassed, she's told that somehow it's her fault because she was asking for it. The guys are annoyed that she didn't like say please and thank you and smile at them and pretend to like them when she didn't. There's a real lack of respect for the women's feelings and her right to say no and assert her own choices. The same way women often are, well, it can happen to anyone, but especially women are murdered by these stalkers who are so enraged at the thought of the woman not liking them back. Even if the viewers are fooled by Joe for a bit or give him the benefit of the doubt, a lot of the characters in you don't give Joe that same courtesy because they see that something's wrong with him. And it's often the crazy people that pick up on this straight away. Peach and Ron the neighbor both sniff out immediately that something's wrong with Joe. And Ron the neighbor says that there's something wrong with Joe and he sees it in his eyes. It's because they see themselves in him, reflected in him. There's a darkness in them that they sense is in him too. And that's why they pick up on it so quickly because birds of a feather, you know? Ron at one point is even intimidated and scared of Joe, which highlights that Joe Joe is worse. Peach is suspicious of Joe and thinks he's creepy. In their first proper conversation, she's like, hmm, what a weird coincidence. You happened to be at the train station and save Beck when she, when she fell onto the tracks and you were there right on time. I mean, what are the odds of bumping into the same person twice in New York? She knows that he's a stalker right off the bat because she's one too. Joe can't grow because he never takes responsibility for anything. I do think Joe is somewhat savable, you could argue. If you actually actually gave a shit about bettering himself. He's just stuck in the same old patterns, not learning anything. In fact, when people call him out, that's when he gets angry. He doesn't like hearing the truth. Candace yelled at him and told him that he was crazy and she didn't love him. And that's when Joe stopped loving her and got furious at her. When Beck said that Joe was sociopathic, evil, wrong, 
that he was the thing he should have killed. That's when Joe suddenly switches off and kills her and stops loving her. Basically, you can't fix a problem if you don't acknowledge there's a problem in the first place. Joe can be an entitled jerk with a huge savior complex, which is so unattractive, like, Ew, it's such an ick. Hmm, you're wearing a short skirt, so you must like a little attention. You've got jangly arm um, bracelets on, therefore you like to make a bit of noise, get some attention. You leave your curtains wide open, therefore I have the right to stand and watch you. In terms of his savior complex too and his entitlement, I remember that Claudia got beat up by Ron and put in the hospital, and she has some very legitimate reasons as to why she can't just leave Ron and why it's not that simple but Joe is so like arrogant he just assumes he knows her life story and assumes that she's a terrible mother and that he knows everything even though he never even bothered to ask he just starts accusing her of not being a good mom and Joe is constantly in his internal monologue making digs at people in his head being really negative about them um, judging them and insulting them and yes sometimes it's very funny but he is very nasty about other people and he doesn't judge himself in the same way it's this cockiness Joe has I'm not like the other guys. I'm special. I'm so superior to other people. I'm the classic glazed donut. I'm not like all those other donuts with the really fancy flavors who are trying too hard, who are pretentious. And his savior complex is highlighted through him trying to fix Beck all the time. He says like 50 times in this series, I can fix you. I can heal you. You don't have to do this, Beck. You can be the woman you should be. Control is not love. Isolating someone is not love. It's an early warning sign as well that someone you're dating could start to hurt you. It's a huge red flag. I'm going to let us take a little bit of an interval, a little break. So go and grab yourself a cup of tea, grab yourself a cookie, babes, okay? And then come back and I want to tell you guys about Beck because I had some huge revelations around this character. So Beck is a college student, a writer, and the main love interest of Joe's in season one. On my first watch, I'm going to be honest, I was a bit judgmental towards Beck simply because I found her really irritating and I missed as well. I just overlooked a lot of the points where she had some character development. But then when I rewatched it, my like M Empathy for her was on a whole other level and I really don't think she's that bad. I think she's such an overhated character and she doesn't deserve it. Beck isn't perfect. She's a human. She's flawed. She can be bitchy. She can be irritating. And I've noticed on social media many tweets and posts being in favour of Jo whilst saying Beck deserved to die anyway. Beck was a bitch. Oh, she's so annoying. Nitpicking every little thing she does and then forgiving Jo. This series has actually had a huge influence on culture and has attracted loads of online and in-person discussions about the romanticization of the serial killer, double standards for men and women, and having a stalker protagonist in general. A lot of people were concerned seeing this huge rise in social media of people supporting Joe. I know Beck isn't the best person, okay? When Joe's dating Karen, it seems like Beck just wants Joe back because she realized what she missed out on and she sees him with someone else. So so now she perceives him as valuable, which is shallow. He was in a relationship with a nice girl. That was wrong. But there are multiple points where Beck has a cry about stuff she's done, where she regrets stuff she's done, where she realizes she's made a mistake, where she apologizes. One really bad moment of Beck earlier on in the series is actually when Peach had been attacked in the park and so Beck's looking after her. And then Joe turns up whose face was beaten to a pulp and he was almost killed. He was hurt way more than Peach was hurt because he was attacked by Ron, his neighbor. So technically both Peach and Joe need looking after and Peach is lying on the couch being fawned over by the girls, having her forehead mopped. And when Joe turns up, none of them have any sympathy for him. They're not trying to look after him. Peach is obviously staying in Beck's home, right? But Peach has the audacity to act as if Joe should leave and Joe isn't welcome there, even though it's not her space. So she doesn't have the right to make that call. Cool. And she also says that male energy is an optimal in my healing space right now and she tells Joe to take back his present he's brought her she's being really mean and rather than Beck defending Joe she actually sides with Peach and tells Joe he should probably go she makes no move to stand up for him because she's quite ungrateful for him at that point and it also highlights this huge double standard we have in terms of feeling like men need to 
not cry. Men need to push through and man up when they have an injury and when they're hurt. Beck can often be a facilitator for when Joe is treated badly and she doesn't defend him in the way that a girlfriend should. Beck is totally devastated after Peach dies and she's not herself. On her birthday, even though they had plans, she wasn't answering his calls. Then she turned up and he said, hey, I'm confused, are you cheating on me? What's going on, you're being weird. And Beck is like, oh my God, how dare you? How dare you think that? How dare you try to control me? She gaslights the shit out of him. At another point, he follows her to a park because he thinks she's cheating. And she says, oh my God, I was just going to see my friend Emma Fox from Brown. How dare you? If we don't have trust, we have nothing. And I believed her. She was lying, gaslighting. It's an abuse tactic, probably one of the worst things she's done in the series. And I'm not denying that, okay? Are you following me? However, when things are going well with Joe before the finale, Beck has so much love to give to Joe and she tells him she's never loved anyone the way that she loves him and she was pushing him away because she wasn't open to love, but she is now and I think she genuinely meant it. I don't think she ever would have cheated on him again and I think she'd come to a new appreciation where she could allow herself to be loved and I think that's really beautiful. The bad stuff she's done is forgivable because at least she's learning. Also, when she cheated on him with Dr. Nikki, he kept contacting her when she was saying it was over, but it's the therapist's responsibility to be professional and to draw that line and know the codes of conduct. I felt bad for Joe because I know now that's twice has been cheated on because Candace cheated on him too, but Joe has some serious entitlement and hypocrisy because Joe cheated on Karen for ages and couldn't even be bothered to apologize or explain himself to her. So it's not okay when someone cheats on him, but it's okay for him to cheat on other people. Beck is a real human. When we see her in the episode called The Captain, we do get some insight into Beck's internal monologue and she has a lot of very negative self-talk. And we know that she was molested by her uncle, which really messed her up because her dad didn't defend her. And so that like really gave her some issues around relationships with men and being able to trust men. And I know she had flaws, but honestly, when Beck died, I felt sick to my stomach for like a day and I couldn't stop thinking be a perfect angel. Did they want her to live up to Joe's exact fantasy of her that was his fault never lie never hook up with guys from tinder because beck has flaws people are saying that she deserved to be murdered she asked for it and that is literally rooted in victim blaming and you cannot even begin to compare the stuff she did to what joe did because joe was stalking and killing people that is not the same. The intense Beck hatred, I think, is unjustified and pretty misogynistic. The author of the novel it's based on, Carolyn Kepner, said, part of the idea for you came from growing up and being naturally wary of upsetting a man, being aware that male emotion is a dangerous thing. If you say no to someone, you're supposed to tell them there's a reason. There has to be an explanation so the man can feel good. It doesn't work that way for women. I think that's so true because even in the finale, when Beck's locked in the cage, she's so scared of Joe's emotion his male emotion. She feels the need to be like, sorry, you can put me back in the cage if you want. I'm sorry, Joe. There is a lot of victim blaming when it comes to Beck saying that she's naive as well, which I think is so ridiculous because she becomes less naive, I feel, as the story goes on, as you can see by her investigating Candace. But it's just that Joe had covered his tracks so well. How was Beck supposed to know any better? He literally photoshopped pictures of Candace saying she was in Italy and showed it to Beck. I mean, come on. I'll actually link to something the actress said about Beck being naive because I think it's really interesting. People really want to label her naive and I'm not so sure that she is because he presents a really good case. They make a good match. She's worried about adulting and school and relationships. You know, she's worried about a lot of different things, day-to-day -day things. She's not thinking worst case scenario and how many of us are? I hope we're not because you don't want to be living out of fear all the time, but this is worst case scenario. But now we've talked about that, I want to talk about Peach and then it will be done. She kissed Beck when they were intoxicated and whenever she needs Beck, she like fakes a suicide attempt or pretends she needs Beck. And then they have this weird codependent thing where Beck feels like she can't say no to her. She can't deal with it when Beck asserts a boundary walks away from her, says she needs to leave, and then she gets nasty. She feels entitled to 
Beck's attention, to Beck's friendship, to Beck's love. It would make sense that her obsession for Beck is so quiet because her family wouldn't approve of her being gay, so she feels like she needs to crush it down, and that just makes it worse. When Beck brings up the kiss the next day and says, you kissed me, what was that about? Peach does some classic abuse tactics that Joe does literally all the time as well. Um, it's called DAVO, and DAVO is an acronym for Deny, Attack, reverse victim and defender. And it's a common manipulation strategy that psychological abusers do. First of all, the abuser denies that the abuse took place. Then they manipulate the victim for holding them accountable. And then they claim that they, the abuser, are actually the victim in the situation. So they reverse the roles. And Peach does all those things. You always do this. What? What do I do? Drama out of nothing. I mean, you were really high. You were leaning into me and quite frankly being very initiating. What? And I went with it because whatever. Jesus Christ, Beck. Be an adult, okay? Take a little responsibility. Was... You have issues, okay? Don't make your desperate, unending need for attention about me. So what? You're just gonna abandon me when I need you the most? Uh, what about my stalker? <gasps> I can't believe you. After all I do for you. You just use people! She denies the kiss by saying that Beck doesn't know what she's talking about because they were all a bit intoxicated. Then she goes on attack mode by saying that Beck is always looking for a fight and making things into a big deal. Then she makes Beck the offender by saying that Beck was coming onto her and being initiating. Then she makes herself the victim, finally, by saying, why are you leaving Beck? Why aren't you staying here and looking after me when I need you the most? And it's funny because Joe does that exact same thing to Beck constantly so that Beck ends up apologizing at the end of it. Shay Mitchell thinks that her love for Beck is genuine and real and it does like come from the right place somewhat because she really values her relationship with Beck. She thinks Beck is like this sweet ball of fluff and she can actually be herself with her and that's why she holds on to the relationship so much because it matters so much to her and she could argue I guess that Joe feels the same way about Beck and he genuinely cares about the relationship somewhat but the way that Peach shows her love is messed up. The thing she does for love is messed up. It's based in control and Joe literally does that same thing. Now in season two there's a new girl in the mix called Love, who Joe is soulmates with, in my opinion. I liked season two, but I didn't love it. I felt like it was a strong building block for the plans they had in the finale and for season three and build up. Season one is so juicy and stuff is happening every episode. It's pacey and it was pretty uneventful a lot of the time in season two, except for the final two episodes, which I thought were really good and very juicy. I prefer the dark New York City vibe of season one, whereas season two, the lighting is brighter and sunnier because Joe's gone to LA and the setting I just didn't like as much. It wasn't as creepy and I know it was because of narrative changes so they needed a shift in location too but I kind of miss season one's vibe. Gamble noted that the whole point of it was to explore influencer culture and dig behind the Hollywood scene and look at the whole wellness culture that is such a big part of Los Angeles. Honestly it really took me out of the show at points. I felt like it just was not suited to a show like you and every time Joe was let's say lying on a table having some sort of spiritual cleansing with acupuncture or whatever it was a bit weird and I didn't love it. I get what they were trying to do and I like the idea of exploring celebrity culture in Los Angeles but honestly this isn't a TikTok a reality show because of this idea of exploring Hollywood culture. There were so many more annoying and shallow irritating and cringy characters which really took me out of the show at points and made it really annoying to watch the love interest of Joe. Her brother Forty is insufferable and so cringy with his dialogue in some scenes and I just for the majority of the show could not stand him. I mean he was good in the finale but other than that I was just so irritated by him and he had so much screen time and also Delilah's younger sister Ellie I found incredibly irritating because of her obnoxious teenager attitude but like such an exaggerated idea of a teenager. She had so many scenes and I have no idea why because she just does nothing for me. And then you add a character like Candace into the mix who can be irritating and loves parents who are just so weird and the result is just this 
influx of really irritating characters and half the time I was like why are we watching this person again and what really saved season two for me was actually love she really held everything together especially in the first five episodes of season two I found myself really missing Beck and Peach because they were such interesting characters and not having them here just made me really sad. However, I'm really pleased that I watched season two because it all escalates in a really juicy way and it sets it up for what could be a really great third season potentially. So I get what they were building into, but I wish they could have built into it a little bit faster. And the stakes are so much higher than in season one, I feel like, because Ellie's on the run, but she knows what kind of a person Joe is and she's got intentions to maybe hurt him in some way. I don't know what she's gonna do and I feel very anxious about that. And we know that Love is pregnant and Joe doesn't really like her that much anymore, but he feels obligated to stay with her because of this baby and all those things are so juicy and we haven't seen the show do that sort of thing before. Another thing I loved about season two is it introduced some balance into the whole show by bringing in a character like Love, who's the mirror of Joe, a reflection of him, the female version doing twisted and immoral things. We also focus more and we give more attention to Joe's victims like Candace, which is nice because it just reminds you that we shouldn't be glorifying a character like Joe. There's more emotional conflict because you have this character like Love who is in many ways just as bad as Joe is or on the same wavelength at least. So viewers are often then divided and forced to think about who they prefer and who's worse. So the first character I want to discuss is Love because she's so interesting. I have to say though, calling her Love, is that really necessary? But the slogan of season two is meet your match, which is such a perfect summary of Love and Joe's relationship because Joe has finally found a worthy opponent. At first, Love is very confident and outspoken and puts herself out there and she seems quite like bubbly and excitable, which makes Joe warm to her because he's like wow she's so sweet and enthusiastic and seems so carefree. To me there was something very unsettling about her right from the beginning and I felt like she had a lot of trauma and her eye contact could be so intense at points and just inappropriate and she's instigating, she's making the moves, she's controlling the pace of the relationship, not Joe which I've never seen before. Trying to go on a date with him and telling him off for not being on time and she's the one trying to woo him and leaving gifts in his locker every day day and asking him out and kissing him first in this very masculine role of pursuing him. And at one point he gets burned. So she just turns up at his house unannounced to give him some sunscreen or something. And she wanted Joe so badly in a way I just couldn't understand. She recommends a book with themes of evil in it and says that she thinks Joe would like it because they're similar. And she's always trying to find a way to read him. And when she learns about the bad stuff Joe has done, contrary to being like terrified of him, she thinks about all the risks and lengths he's gone to for her and she's almost wooed by it. It makes her like him more. She also spends a lot of time thinking about food and in the kitchen she tries to win him over with food, trying to find him the best food in Los Angeles. But I was sure right from the beginning that love was a killer like Joe. There was no doubt in my mind. I know some people were shocked by it when they found out but I was certain from day one because they were doing this scene where Joe had killed someone kind of in self-defense. Joe was getting rid of the body and then the scene alternated between that and Love cutting up some red meat and it was just very morbid and I could see the parallels there. But later on Love becomes suspicious of Candace who's actually got a fake name and is pretending to be someone called Amy Adams because she's dating Love's brother and Love is very suspicious so she looks into Candace and I thought that it was so interesting that she did this and I was sure that if she'd done this to Candace then she'd definitely at some point hired a private investigator to look into Joe too and this just confirmed to me that they're two sides of the same coin. Joe because he had this secret cage room um, had Delilah come in without meaning to she just turned up and she saw a lot of bad stuff that Joe had done like killing Henderson and so Joe had to lock her up in this cage but he was genuinely trying to be better so he had intentions to set Delilah free but when he um, came back to check that her handcuffs had released her she was dead and Joe had a lot of memory loss because he'd been drugged so he didn't know if he'd killed her or not and he was freaking out thinking 
am I like a proper bad person killing people who don't deserve it like I did in season one? Because he's trying to improve. He doesn't just want to be killing good people who haven't done anything wrong. And the last person he suspected was Love. But I was sure that somehow Love had been stalking him and she knew that he had kidnapped Delilah. And so she thought, okay, I'll make the job easier for him and just kill Delilah. And it turns out I was right. And we also learned that she killed her au pair when she was younger and framed it on her brother. But I still get more unsettled with Joe than with Love, but we'll see. What's fascinating to me is that a few people don't know, obviously, about Love's sadistic tendencies. So they step in to try and help and tell her to stay away from Joe because Joe's dark past is exposed. People who find out about it, like Forty and Candace, are trying desperately to warn Love, but she doesn't want to hear it. She doesn't want to acknowledge the kind of guy that Joe is, and she's blinded. And she was like that since day one, trying to woo him for no understanding reason. For me, it's a message about how women in society are so forgiving of the men in their lives and just desperate for their attention when it's completely undeserved. Because Love makes comments about Candace saying, she's crazy, what would she know? When Candace is trying to help her, Candace was trying to help, trying to protect Love from what she thought was a dangerous situation. And she said, wherever Joe goes, trouble follows. He'll end up killing you. She was trying to help. And Forty was trying to help too, but Love was a complete completely turning a blind eye. And then she killed Candace to shut her up and she had no regret. She's questioning Candace's experience as a victim of Joe. Despite this, the reason I sympathize with Love more than I sympathize with Joe is because she was accepting of who Joe was. The reason I'm resentful towards Joe is because he's still got this weird thing where he really almost fetishizes and fantasizes about the women in his lives without seeing them for who they are. At least Love saw Joe and she recognized him and still accepted him and still wanted him. Joe wants Love to be like this perfect saint in the same way he did with Beck and with Candace, where when they cheat or they're unfaithful or they're shallow, he just is so like disgusted when it was so blatantly obvious the whole time and all he needed to do was open his eyes and look, but he doesn't want to. That's why I sympathize with Love because it's not her fault she can't live up to this idealized fantasy girl who's got in his head. And the actress Victoria Pedretti said, it's an interesting representation of women like Love who seem like they support other women and then a man comes along and all of a sudden they don't recognize the other women in their lives. Love is so completely absorbed in the idea of people trying to ruin her relationship with Joe with no sense of actually you're trying to protect me maybe I should listen. She writes off everything Candace says as she's crazy. It's something we hear all the time. She's crazy. Nobody listens to Candace when she's brave enough to speak up. It's not like it's easy for Candace. It's not like she takes joy out of coming into their life to ruin it. Now we've talked about Love who I think is a great female character. Let's discuss Joe and how he's progressed this season compared to last season. Joe's ex Candace comes back who he thought was dead and she threatens him and in this season he's scared that she's going to turn him into the police or ruin his life so he runs away. He is in constant paranoia and fear that Candace will come back in some way. He's not in control for once and that's why he's so anxious because Candace is the one calling the shots. And you can see him trying to get back control in some way because his narration changes in season two. At the beginning of season two, there's this weird thing where Joe's telling the story and suddenly he reveals that he's been keeping something from the audience the whole episode and something's happened a few hours ago and it starts to make you feel like he's unreliable, you're out of the loop and he's not telling us stuff. For instance, he makes it seem like when he meets Love, it's the first time he's ever met her in the grocery store and they just happen to to bump into each other but then at the end of the episode he suddenly reveals that he's been stalking her and obsessed with her for weeks and even moved in next door to her intentionally knowing she was next door and we had no idea about that. There's lots of insights given into Joe's backstory and childhood which was very much needed and very appreciated about his mum who at points tried her best but wasn't always really there for him and she was often abandoning him places and his dad was abusive and he ended up killing his his dad to protect his mom as a kid. His mom taught Joe a lot about secrecy, like hiding stuff in the wall. And now as an adult, every 
girl that Joe seeks out is similar to his mum in some way, even looks like his mum, which shows that the reason why he develops these fantasies about these women is because he's subconsciously trying to heal this relationship he has with his mum. It all goes back to his mum. And he says he's doing his best to be better, but he says he's doing it for love, to be the kind of man she wants, which is a real shame because he really should just be doing it for himself. But Joe changes a lot in season two, and there's a lot more depth given there. He becomes way more self-aware in season two, which I love. He makes these comments like, there's this dark part of me that I let get out of control before and I need to suppress it again. Joe kidnaps this guy called Will so that he can take on Will's identity, but then he realizes that he feels guilty and he doesn't want to do it. And he genuinely ends up letting Will go to carry on with his life. And Will even gives him his real number. So Joe calls him while Will's in Spain or wherever he is and they talk. And Joe realizes that one, Will's a good guy, and two, he thinks he's made a bit of a friend out of the experience. That is something season one Joe never would have done. He would have just killed Will without any remorse, but you can see that Joe's trying not to be that guy. He's also being haunted by Beck's ghost and by Candace, and he's actually terrified of repeating the same mistakes he's made that put other people in danger and doomed his relationship. So he is, for many episodes in season two, keeping distance from love because he doesn't trust himself to be safe and to to keep other people safe. It's ironic though, because Joe keeps trying to be a better person in season two, but then as a result, he's actually making it worse because he's getting involved in stuff he shouldn't be getting involved in. And by the way, I am in no way trying to say that I like this guy, that I justify his actions, that I think he's a sweetheart or anything at all, but I'm just saying that I saw more of a human soul. Joe actually believes what Candace is saying and he's like, oh my God, you're right, I am a bad guy. And he even says, Candace, you're right, like I did hurt you. I hurt Delilah and then love comes in and he's like look love I'm not safe I did these bad things I'm a monster and he has the opportunity to escape this cage he's locked into but he decides not to because he deserves to be in jail and he's fully ready to just go to prison which for Joe is like huge but then Love reveals a lot of bad things that she's done because she kills Candace, reveals that she killed Delilah and she killed her au pair. She goes to let Joe out of the cage and he tries to kill her and he would have done if she hadn't revealed that she was pregnant. It was such a step back and I was like, he clearly hasn't changed at all because he's saying all this stuff about, I want to be better. And then two minutes later, he goes to kill his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend Love. And that's not okay. Like she wasn't trying to attack him. She was letting him out. Love almost makes him stay with her. He feels obligated to as she's pregnant. And so they move in together into this new quiet neighborhood, which by the way, I love the setting of. I didn't love the LA setting, but this suburban thing they're going for, I'm obsessed with. I can't wait to watch season three. I just think it's so beautiful and different to anything we've seen. In the final few minutes of the show, Joe looks through this fence and sees this neighbor, this blonde neighbor. And even though Love has just gotten back together with him technically, and she's carrying his baby, he's already moving on to cheating on love with the next girl. Rather than talking about what's bothering him and his relationship with love, communicating with her, he's bottling it up. He's having these private feelings like love is dangerous, but he's not explaining this to her. He's just acting like everything's fine and then deciding to pursue this affair. Once he's got the woman and once they're not who he thinks he wants them to be, he just ditches them and moves on to the next one. He's got an actual problem. And what's so crazy is when he looked through the fence at this neighbor, he couldn't even see her face. She had this huge hat on. He couldn't even see really her body, the side of her leg and her arm, her shoulder with her diary. He was hooked and he was going on this five minute rant about how amazing she is and how he needs to know everything about her, which shows that the women are just a physical object for him to project his fantasies onto. In the first season, Beck seemed like his entire world. Everything he did revolved around her. Then in season two, he forgets about Beck as if she never meant anything. And then he just moves on to love and has all these obsessive thoughts about her being his soulmate. And then when she's not this perfect angelic cooking queen goddess like he had in his head, he ditches her and moves on to the neighbor. And then when the neighbor isn't what he wants, he'll ditch her. Do you know what I mean? He just, <laughs> he 
keeps doing it. The final character I want to talk about is Candace, who actually plays a really key role in this season because she was only ever mentioned in season one as this girl that still haunts Joe. And out of all his exes or relationships, she's the one that stuck with him the most because there was this unfinished business. And I think she haunted him because she was just so mean to him and it really bothered him. But then it turns out she's not dead when she comes back in season two. And she says that she's going to make him see who he really is and the kind of man he is. And she doesn't just want to make it easy for him. Candace really annoyed me in the first episode, to be honest. I found her really kind of cringy with some of her lines and over the top. And it felt like a bunch of hot air. Her saying, watch me ruin your life. I'm not gonna make this easy on you. But I wasn't actually seeing her do that. So I was like, oh, whatever. This girl is so useless. But then I saw the lengths she was going to to expose Joe to everyone. And I was really impressed with her. Like she was making him really uneasy and no one else ever had the guts to properly stand up to him in that way other than Peach. So it was really refreshing to see someone seeing him, really seeing him for the kind of guy he is and making life difficult for him. And I ended up thoroughly enjoying her character this season. I liked seeing seeing her trying to ruin his life and infiltrate his relationship with love and then her dating 40 to try and get close to Joe under this fake name and Joe not being able to say anything about it and him living in this constant fear of being exposed by her. It was really clever. Candace isn't this cold hearted bitch. She genuinely wants to help the women who Joe will date and protect them. She knew that Joe was involved with Beck's death and she doesn't want another girl to go through that same fate. She's trying to protect Love and Forty from getting involved with someone like Joe. I was so disgusted with Love for killing her because honestly, Candace didn't deserve it. She was only trying to help and do the good moral thing even though she was putting herself in danger and props to her. She thought she'd exposed Joe and done a great job because she found him in the cage with Delilah's dead body but ironically Joe actually hadn't killed Delilah at all. It was love and then Candace gets killed by love and the whole thing is just the irony. But Candace achieved her goal. She said she wanted to make Joe see who he really was and see his own darkness and I mean he did, like in the finale, in a lot of ways he did go, oh, I'm not a very good person. I don't trust myself. Did I kill Delilah? Probably, I'm not trustworthy. And so I know that maybe she didn't achieve as much as she wanted and she didn't maybe make him have as many revelations about himself as she would have wanted. But I still think that she made him very uncomfortable this season and she did a better job than anyone really could have. So I was really sad to see her go, but I have to say I'm excited for season three, especially because like I said, this kind of suburban housewife setting looks so cool. And I'm very excited to see what I'm sure will be a very interesting cat and mouse game between Love and Joe and their marriage. And it's giving me very much Gone Girl vibes, like them being trapped in a house together, pretending to be fine raising this kid, but they actually hate each other like that's really juicy so i'm really excited also before we go look at these earrings aren't they gorgeous they're little feathers they're giving me like very much aria from pretty little liars vibes which is so cool because i've wanted feather earrings since i was about 12 because i saw her wearing them in the show and i was like feather earrings amazing i have to get them years later i've got them aren't they beautiful if i can find any that are similar to this i'll link them down in the description too in my history of scared this is the most scared I've ever been. Congratulations, Dad. It's a boy. Did I love season three? I thought it was good. I wasn't crazy about it, if I'm honest. I would still recommend watching it. But for me, season one will always be my favorite. And that's just where I have a real soft spot for the show and the writing, especially because it's so true to the original source material. And season three, the idea has so much potential. I love the fact that Joe and Love are in this relationship in the same house, but they can't trust each other. It gives it this very suspenseful tone because every scene, they're together. He goes to bed next to her, they're together, but they don't like each other and don't trust each other. It's like sleeping with the enemy. You know that at one point, one of them is going to snap and try and hurt the other and you don't know how they'll react. That was a great concept. That was definitely the strongest part of the season for me. In other aspects, I felt like the writing was a bit muddled and all over the place. In terms of the direction of where it was going and the structure and the pacing, it was all a bit whack. 
<laughs> it was so weird. Joe's fixation is on, what's her name? I don't know what her name is. She's not important, but this neighbor, Natalie or something, he's obsessed with her. And I thought, okay, Natalie's going to be a very important character in this season. And it's going to be about Joe navigating this relationship with Natalie. He knows he's technically cheating on love because she's his wife, but he can't help but fall for Natalie because she seems like this enigma. She's mysterious. He can project his fantasies onto her because he doesn't know her. He just can make up whatever he wants. And so it's convenient. But then the pacing's so weird because we go from that to suddenly Joe getting this new fixation on Marianne or whatever her name is, becoming obsessed with her and then trying to cover up Natalie's murder. And I just, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, if Natalie wasn't that important, then why was she here? And why are we now focused on Marianne who I didn't think was important? And now we're thinking about her. It's just the fact that they had all these really intense things happen and then they were just almost skimmed over. Like we barely had time for him to develop his relationship with Natalie because she died so quick, like an episode or two in. Even with Marianne, I felt like I didn't know her, but there was so much emphasis on how important she is, but she was a pretty flat character. And then so many people died this season, but it was just a little bit rushed. And it really bothered me because the ideas were good, but they could have taken more time with them, basically is what I'm saying. They were trying to cram so much into one season. At points it felt like nothing was happening and it was moving really slowly. And then suddenly, oh my God, someone's locked in the cage and they have to figure out what to do with them. Pacing was a bit weird. What makes up for it is the amazing, very complicated dynamic between Joe and Love. And I thought it was so real and so intense seeing the way their relationship evolved. When Love was devastated, yelling at Joe, why don't you love me anymore? It just cut into me because I could see that as crazy as they both are, she genuinely loves him and cares about him and she can't understand why she's not enough for him and she feels like the minute she fails him in some way or doesn't live up to his expectations, he'll just drop her and he'll make this really harsh, nasty judgment and there's nothing she can do to escape it like he's just made up his mind about her and it's so hard for her to deal with because she's trying but he's not seeing it and I feel like that's definitely one of Joe's worst qualities is how cutthroat and mean he can be to people he's supposed to love and apparently cares about and he just can go from being really obsessed with them to completely cutting them out and being really harsh and it's very odd and it clearly shows that you never loved them at all because if you really loved them you wouldn't bail on them so quickly and he was the same with Beck like he was all talk she's so amazing she's the love of my life and then she disappoints him and he just ditches her and moves on and it shows that the interest was never really genuine in the first place otherwise you wouldn't just be able to forget about it so easily and I love how much season three focuses on this very complicated dynamic between this married couple it's really really fascinating I still have way more compassion for her than I do for Jo because in her own way she does care and she just wants things to be okay and in the first few episodes Joe is treating her really badly he's avoiding her because she's a murderer you see her doing things she wouldn't normally do letting people disrespect her she's not really cooking as much like she loses her passion in things for a while she starts doubting her own abilities especially because she lost her brother 40 in the last season and Joe isn't even checking in with her mental health at all so she's lost this really important figure in her life 40 who she had a very intense relationship with and now he's not there anymore and then her husband who's meant to care about her isn't supporting her and then her mom is being an absolute biatch <laughs> treating her badly being nasty to her not being there for her she's not getting any support from her husband letting her deal with this he's not actually checking in being a chef is the most important thing to love cooking and expressing her love through food as we know she's giving joe this pastry that she bought from the shop to try and get him to compare it to her pastries which he's not even eating or really or paying attention to and then she's saying or should I start my own bakery trying to get his input? And he's not even listening. He's completely distracted. And that for her was, I think, a really big moment where she realized, oh my God, he hasn't forgiven me. Things aren't going well. I don't know how to fix this because he knows that baking is the most important thing in the world to her. That's what made them connect in the first place. And he's not even giving her the time of day. He's not even paying her attention. It's really bad. And so this is really affecting Love's mental state. Joe, meanwhile, 
is so quick to bounce onto Marianne and then this other neighbor Natalie and he's just all over the place and I have to say that I really enjoyed Joe's character in season one because I enjoyed following this very twisted character I like following the bad guy for once but it's like progressively he's just getting more and more annoying and less enjoyable I genuinely thought he's a really good main character in season one he's unusual he stands out he's distinctive but I'm just getting sick of him in season three and I don't know if anyone else feels the same way let me know but he's so tiresome and genuinely irritating in season three because he keeps making the same mistakes and his pattern of getting obsessed with a new woman and moving on to them is getting old really fast like he's not doing anything wallowing in his own misery and keeps telling himself what a great guy he is when he's clearly not which is also annoying so I was much more invested in the storylines of characters like love and more minor characters even ones like Theo because there's something fresh in you love's mom I found interesting because she's something different she's like a breath of fresh air and being stuck in Joe's head all the time can get really tiring in the first episode love is suspecting that Joe has this obsession with Natalie because love is very very intuitive and she knows how to read Joe really well because there's such similar people People. Even though it's only one episode in, Love isn't dumb. She's noticing Joe's apparent obsession with Natalie and so she does confront him about it and she says, are you obsessed with Natalie? Are you, not do you have a crush on her, do you like her? Are you obsessed with her? Because she knows how Joe is, she knows what his patterns are and the way that he forms attachments to women, his very specific way of doing it. So Love knows how to see the red flags. Joe is stupid to think he could ever possibly get away with it because Love is on to him. It makes me really sad that Love and Joe couldn't find a way to make their relationship work, to fix things, because they are in a strange way perfect for each other. They both have very similar issues and flaws and they on a fundamental level understand what's going on in the other person's head. They don't communicate about anything and that's why I really loved this season is it's like a perfect example of what not to do in a marriage and how a marriage can break down because they completely lose communication in their relationship. Like something's bothering her and she says, are you obsessed with Natalie? He doesn't tell her the truth. And they're constantly like, if they're killing someone or something's happening, they don't actually let each other know or inform each other. They just go behind the other person's back. So there's this huge distrust that starts to form in the relationship. And as a result of Joe not really being there for love and her not feeling attended to by him and her knowing that he's cheating on her, she needs support so she starts having these feelings for this guy um, Theo who's a college student but it's really bad too like it comes across so creepy and, and weird because he's so obsessed with her there's just something a bit odd about love being so much older with a kid he kept pushing to be in a relationship with love Theo does respect those boundaries at first but then love keeps asking him how he is and spending a lot of time with him and chatting to him and not being super firm so that starts to confuse Theo and he's like wait maybe I do have a chance because she is being sweet with me and they kiss and stuff so you can tell that he's like I don't know she seems attracted to me maybe this could work he's still got a bit of hope there and then he comes back and then she gets really nasty and it's so dumb it's like she starts to lead him on a bit and then when he responds appropriately and reaches out she's like no that can't ever happen again go away so as weird as it was I did understand why she was forming feelings for him because he was really devoted to her and complimentary and saying how beautiful she was and making an effort like Joe was in the early stages of their relationship and so yes it's stupid and setting a terrible example for her young son and everything but that just is a reflection of how bad her relationship with Joe is at this time I didn't like Theo at first I found him really annoying I was like why are you here mate leave her alone can't you see she's married go away but he really started to grow on me as the episodes went by because he just seemed like a confused kid doing his best and not realizing the kind of person that love was and she treated him like such shit at the end when she thought he was going to find out her secret she could have killed him she pushes him down the stairs and I felt so bad because he honestly didn't deserve that and he wasn't trying to threaten her or ruin her life or anything and oh god whole thing's so complicated but it makes sense that she was in that situation because Joe was so uncommitted to her and that's the thing so many different aspects of Joe could trigger us and it depends really 
what speaks to you on an individual level and what your red flags are and what your history is. And every single person has a different thing that will eventually make them really dislike Joe because of course we don't like Joe. What always bothered me the most was his complete lack of respect for the women in his life like violating their boundaries and breaking into their houses, stealing their stuff. The stalkerish behavior, the invasion of privacy, because it's a huge sign of disrespect, to be honest, that I couldn't stand. The opposite of supporting women or whatever you want to call it because of how creepy and invasive and predatory it was. But for other people, maybe that isn't so bad to them, but what bothers them is the way that he keeps making up shit about how he's such a great person because it just gets really old after a while, his lack of being honest with himself. But for someone else I spoke to, what really bothered them was in season three with Joe's infidelity and the fact that he's got a wife and a young son, but he's obsessed with his neighbor and that he would just ditch his current relationship like that. And for some people, that's where they would draw the line and that's what would bother them, you know? So we all have different things that stand out to us, but I personally really didn't like that he was so quick to give up on what he had with love because it shows that he's not actually trying to fix his issues, he's running away from them because the problem is him. He's going to keep replicating these problems. But when Love finds out that he has this interest in Natalie, Love goes absolutely ballistic and <laughs> kills Natalie with an axe, which oh my god, the amount of people that Love attacked this season or hurt in some way because they bothered her was hilarious. She just has no chill. If someone rubs her the wrong way, if they do something that could maybe hurt her child, if they might report her to the police for something, if they're flirting with her husband, she will just go and kill them and lock them in a cage. Oh, and then it's so funny, if she doesn't kill them and she just locks them in the cage, then she has to go to Joe and be like, um, can you help me? I did it again. She's so driven by impulsivity and stuff. And it's funny that it bothers Joe so much. She's so out of control. She's so impulsive. Oh my God, can't she ever premeditate anything? Because he is also really uncontrolled sometimes. I find it funny that he thinks he's so much holier than thou. Like he's so amazing when he does the exact same thing. There are quite a few problems that I have with season three in terms of just pacing and a few really stupid things that didn't make sense that were dumb, whether it was cringy dialogue or something being a little bit too unbelievable or being scattered or annoying characters or whatever. But I have to say that one of my favorite things about season three is the comedy aspect because the whole thing's so ridiculous. Maybe they were taking themselves a bit too seriously in season one and they realized that because in season three, the writers are fully aware of how ridiculous everything is with love killing people left and right. And so they really amp up the comedy aspects of it. When love kills Natalie, she's like, oh, maybe we could frame this as a suicide and say that Natalie was really depressed and she couldn't take it anymore and she killed herself. And Joe's like, killed herself with an axe. <laughs> with an axe, like it's so funny. Just those really blunt, dry humor moments are just so good. Like the show knows it's dumb and it's just going with it and putting the characters into increasingly comedic situations, which I really like because it makes it more enjoyable to watch actually. It's more bearable, it's not too heavy and really funny, like genuinely. I think the writers at some point must have had this realization about how ridiculous it is for these two literal serial killers to be in a relationship, constantly paranoid that the other one's gonna go crazy and then they're gonna have to cover it up and hope they don't get caught. And so the show just really embraces it and rolls with it rather than shying away from it. And it makes for some really funny moments, especially with Love. I was really obsessed with her character this season because she just keeps effing up and making things worse and putting herself into these really risky situations and it's just really cool. Another thing I didn't love is that as the episodes progress we keep getting flashbacks to Joe's childhood and him being bullied and there's this constant emphasis on Joe feeling like the outsider as in maybe he's partly the way he is because he didn't have a normal community of friends and there's this whole thing of him being an adult finally learning to stand up to some bullies and assert himself in a way that he couldn't as a kid and this other insight into this woman who was a bit of a mother figure to him that he felt very protective of. She was in this um, very toxic relationship and he was powerless to stop it and he just had to watch and so he couldn't step in to protect women so he feels like he needs to do that now. He was bullied so that's why 
he's too reliant on romantic relationships because he was never included but it honestly just comes across as really boring and unnecessary and forced and I'm more for giving backstory into Joe's life but I was noticing myself really disengaging with a lot of those flashbacks and memories and not finding them particularly insightful in any way like it wasn't some sort of light bulb for me where I was like oh my gosh this makes so much sense about Joe's psychology I was kind of like I don't really care <laughs> and also it's so weird to imply that Joe was as a kid this this really good kid who really cared about this woman's mental health and hated the thought of her being in an abusive relationship and wanted to protect her from these nasty men because it's like don't try and get it twisted Joe is one of those nasty men he's not a protector he was never a protector as a kid like I hate that they're trying to to twist it to make it seem like he kind of has these caring sides with the women in his life because I really don't think that he does and I'd rather you just committed a bit more to him not being a great kid to him always being abnormal to him always viewing women as objects and as property because that's who he is and it's really annoying that he has this constant savior complex like for instance as an adult he meets Marianne's ex-partner who's a real douche and Joe was so angry like how dare this guy be so mean to Marianne he treats her like an object and it gets really annoying because Joe is literally no better and I hate how they bring in characters like Marianne's nasty ex-partner to almost make it seem like Joe isn't quite as bad or there are people out there worse than him or something because there's just no one no one can make me like Joe or think he's not that bad even the fact that he gets away with killing his wife love at the end of the season is really annoying to me that he just keeps getting away with it so I hope that in season four if that's the final season there is some repercussions for Joe and some justice and he does get what he deserves ultimately in the finale which I really liked love um, goes to poison Joe but he's already figured out she's going to do that and so he ends up killing her before she can kill him and it just really bothered me that this this is another person that Joe's gotten away with victimizing and I just hate the thought of him running free so I know in season four he's going to go off and look for Marianne and I hope that actually he's brought to justice or he's, he's finally caught or something happens because it's just it's so frustrating it's not like I'm saying love's so amazing she didn't deserve that I was hardly rooting for love either in the first few episodes I was genuinely feeling bad for her because she was doing her best but when I found out like I'd suspected that she had killed her first husband and the fact she tried to kill Theo and all the various people she's attacked throughout the season. It's so cool to have a female character who's so cutthroat and aggressive. I absolutely love it. But it hardly makes me like her as a person. I wasn't particularly sad when she died, you know, because it seemed a long time coming. It seemed inevitable, especially considering how bad things were getting between her and Joe. I was certain that it would escalate to one of them killing the other eventually and I love it because it reminded me of Gone Girl or one of those thriller shows which is really cool where there's this power dynamic going on where one person has the power and then it switches it's really cool but I can't wait for season four I'm looking forward to reviewing it I think it comes out around October but I'll have to check did you kill someone oh did someone break your heart did you break my heart Marianne now we've discussed the evolution of the seasons, I was going to do a whole section here talking about season four and the different characters, but there was a slight issue, which is that it was so boring, I couldn't actually sit through it. Season four was so dull and I've done this before where I've managed to somehow sit through the boredom like with Once Upon a Time which we covered recently. I'll link those videos if you want to watch them but I did lots of videos about that show and I did find it boring at points but I kind of forced myself to just pay attention. For some reason I couldn't do that with you. Like I found it really really hard to concentrate. I was really bored with season four and sometimes it's bearable sometimes you go it's fine I'll just sit through it for the review because I have to because I need to have reviewed the whole thing and I feel a certain pressure especially as a reviewer to make like a fair and balanced review so I feel obligated to sit through and watch the whole thing but there's a point like there's a line and it was just crossing that line where I was like you know what I'm getting actually really exhausted I'm not enjoying this anymore and I can't keep sitting through this which was the case with season four. I watched a few episodes and I was like, you know what? 
I can't do it to myself. It's not worth it. And I'm not saying that season four was like terrible, but it did seem like a big step down from the previous seasons in the sense that regardless of whether you say the show is a bit trashy or a bit whatever, it doesn't matter. You can't deny it is fun and engaging and it's never boring. Like I was very, very interested in all the characters. And then when Love left the show, it's like I could no longer pay as much attention anymore. I felt like the show should have ended there or something like it's not the same without her and I'm struggling to get behind this new group of characters they brought in in season four because I'm not finding myself attached to anyone if you did like season four that's great and I'm glad someone enjoyed it but for me it wasn't good enough where I can be like okay I'm gonna concentrate I'm gonna sit through this and I'm going to enjoy it because I'm just I'm not I'm not enjoying it I'm not it was boring. It was really, really slow. We see Joe is like this professor and he's got a beard now. And I get that they're trying to vamp it up and make it look different by showing that he's different and all these little ways that he's changed. But if I'm bored, then it's not gonna happen. You know what I mean? And I don't care how much they try to have a fresh take and go for a different vibe. It's somehow, it doesn't have the same like vibe as the previous seasons and you would think it would be interesting because it's like every season they do a little location change or something like we go from a busy city to the suburbs or whatever and they've done it again here but it just really lost my attention. I wasn't finding Joe as interesting for some reason anymore without love there and it just felt like the same repetitive pattern and this whole murder mystery thing like I'm not invested in. I'm not saying it's like, oh my gosh, you shouldn't like it. This is just my opinion. But for me, I was like, I can't watch this. Like this isn't as fun to me anymore. And I binged the previous seasons. Like I sat through beginning to end. My mum watched it too and she's not even a TV watcher. And we were like, wow, this is so juicy. I'm eating it up. And then we started season four. And I was like, I don't know why, but this just isn't the show that I know. And I'm just losing the incentive to like finish watching it. So I'm sorry if that like disappoints you guys and you wanted this really in-depth thing on season four. I really did try. I gave it my best effort, but sometimes it's just not worth the pain, you know? So this is more of than a review of, I guess, seasons one to three, because that's what I actually understand, because I've seen the whole thing. But let me know what you guys think in the comments. Also, if you're looking for a new deodorant wild sponsored one of my last videos and they're literally amazing and I would talk about them even if I wasn't sponsored by them but I would highly recommend that you check out their mostly natural and refillable more environmental cruelty free products they really are great they smell amazing and I'll link it in the description if you want to get um, a discount off your first wild order 20% off and use my code serena2024 so thank you for watching and I will see you guys for the next video.